a new order of things, came in many ways with freedom. I recall the coming of colored troops to take the place of the white ones in Macon. William Sanders Scarborough. Here's a man that was born as a slave in this town. He was 12 years old when slavery ended. Wrote about that era in detail. Word had gotten out that, as you know, when the Civil War started, that if you made your way to the, you know, to the Union forces, you would actually see freedom. They was willing to fight for their own freedom. Harrison Wilson forces had actually made it here to Macon. They had recruited over 2,700 you know, former slaves. Wilson's forces were approaching the city. Life now took on a panic-stricken aspect with the daily prayer meetings of the white people on Macon Green. While we looked on breathlessly, secretly praying that victory would rest within the Union forces in the end. It was not until later that we learned that the surrender of the city by General Howard Cobb had taken place outside of the city limits. The Union Army who had come in had formed the colored troops here, and so they were actually um, assigning them to patrol and take care of the streets of Megan, which was a bitter pill to swallow for a lot of the former Confederates. Officers had been detailed by General Wilson to announce the new relations now to exist between the whites and the blacks. The meeting was held in the Presbyterian Church. The house was packed. I saw and heard as I sat perched in an open window. A joyful boy who knew now that there was a possibility of his dreams becoming a reality. There was that rejoicing with cries and tears by which only a long enslaved and suffering people could voice their emotions as they realized that the day of freedom, so long prayed for, had at last dawned. Two years after Scarborough saw the end of slavery in Macon, black men gained citizenship and voting rights in the period known as Reconstruction. Some white and black citizens worked together to build schools and churches to create a new community where they would share political power, but it wouldn't last long. One of the greatest uh, stories in the United States, in my opinion, is the story of the American Missionary Association. These were missionaries, mostly uh, white teachers that had been trained by some of the best universities in the United States that had the unmitigated audacity to come south after the Civil War and to teach former adult slaves and former uh, enslaved children uh, to read and write in the African-American community of that era. That was simply unheard of. These kinds of highly qualified teachers and people that just care about helping to lift up the black people. I recall cultured, sympathetic, self-sacrificing men and women who left homes of comfort and ease to help a newly freed people to acquire all they could give. Yes, more than this, to endure ostracism, insult, and calumny. Schools were in, in church basements in different halls that they could find, you know. People were asked to bring firewood to try to keep it going, you know, to keep the heat off if they could and so forth. And the pictures you see of people just lined up on benches, young and old, was how it was. Lewis High School was erected by the American Missionary Association, aided by the Freeman's Bureau. It was burned together with the adjacent chapel and teacher's home in December 1876 believed undoubtedly to be the work of incendiaries opposed to the school. It was rebuilt later and renamed the Ballot School. There's a wonderful picture that was in uh, by uh, A.R. Ward, W-A-U-D, that was done in uh, Harper's Weekly in 1867 of, of black men lined up in Macon, Georgia. It's an actual drawing here in Macon, lined up to vote. And like I said, my ancestor Lot was here. He was up in age, he was in his 60s. And you know, I like to pretend that's him because it's an elderly gentleman waiting to line up to vote. And you had many people who were leading institutions. Of course, that 1870 Voting Rights Act, uh, which took us to the polls, took us to actually vote, to actually be engaged in the voting process and having uh, in the Republican Party uh, this kind of 
deep rooted connection and desire to be a part. Scarborough was too young to vote, but he met Macon's first black representative, Henry McNeil Turner, a Union Army chaplain elected to the Georgia legislature in 1868. Henry McNeil Turner appeared to have no fear whatsoever. He spoke very boldly. Uh, he was a, a representative in the state legislature, our first black representative. And he's one of, a many, of, of many notable figures. I think a lot of the people in Reconstruction were forged out of fire. I didn't discover the fact that Henry McNeil Turner, one of the most eloquent uh, political speakers during that era uh, of, of uh, the Civil War and shortly thereafter, I didn't realize that this man had represented Macon during the um, uh, Reconstruction. A majority of white legislators voted to expel Turner and all black legislators from the assembly. It is extraordinary that in a land where ringing chimes call child and sire to the church of God, a land where Bibles are read and gospel truths are spoken, and where courts of justice are presumed to exist. It's extraordinary that, with all of these advantages on your side, you can make war upon the poor, defenseless black man. You know we have no money, no railroads, no telegraphs, no advantages of any sort, and yet all manner of injustice is placed upon us. And if you listen to Henry McNair Turner's speech that he gave on the floor of the State House, he he was begging to be included. For, and he wasn't talking about give me, uh, uh, just give me mine a little bit over here and we'll be satisfied with it. No, he said, we want to be part of the, of the, of the whole solution. You know, we want to be part of the development of the South, the redevelopment of the South coming out of this destructive war. We want to have our voices heard, but we also want to make a contribution. We will accept you as my brother and, 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 and as my sister. By 1870, Macon had a racially integrated city council. Edward Woodluff, I don't know what motivated him, but he ran for uh, city council. So in 1870, he was the first African-American elected to city council in Macon. If you go through the city council minutes, they really don't make a distinction after a certain point that he's not white. It's just a list of the city councilmen and how they voted. And they're having to accept that others, both black and white, can come in and, and, and can govern and discuss issues. The Union Army was still here, so you did, things didn't return to normal right away. And then you end up with a gentleman like Jefferson Long who makes the decision to run for, uh, for Congress. And I think, I can ima can't imagine you know, they probably thought it was a big deal to get elected to city council or even to state legislative office, but to get elected to the U.S. government uh, would have been unimaginable for, uh, for both groups of people here. People like Jefferson Long, Jefferson Franklin Long, with such dedication to his community, when he went to Washington, D.C., the first black man to speak to Congress on the floor, he stood in the shoes that are now being filled by Austin Scott uh, today and uh, some of the others, people like Jim Marshall and people like that that have been the U.S. congressman for our area. The fact that we had state and uh, federal representatives, African-American, or as we said, uh, colored representation during that era, isn't well known by the kids today. We, we certainly love to train our eyes on uh, Harriet Tubman and on Frederick Douglass and on uh, some of the great, great, great uh, figures and, and leaders uh, of this nation uh, from the black community. But right here in Macon, we have many that uh, we really must look to and draw from solutions they've had. Scarborough grew up and went on to greatness as a world-renowned classic scholar and university president. Henry Magnet Turner recognized this young lad as being a brilliant, having a brilliant mind. He went to finish high school in Atlanta, went on to the various universities, became a university president. Now, 
I was somewhat embarrassed that I didn't even know who William Sanders Scarborough was. Most people didn't know about him, even though he meant so much to the world, gave so much to academia right here from Macon, Georgia, born a young slave boy and made all these contributions. Many in Macon bitterly resented emancipation and all the progress black Maconites had made in such a short period. When the Union Army left, black civil rights and political opportunities eroded quickly. They allowed former Confederates to re retain the power bases they had getting reelected as governors and, and mayors and, and so forth. So as soon as they got into power, they started changing the law. And so it's kind of like 1890 and 1900 shuts the door on all the progress that was made. And the pro hard part was you had a lot of people who had enjoyed that progress, who weren't gonna let it go, but they still didn't have enough power to help change everything. Reconstruction was a chance to reestablish Macon upon freedom and equality, but the city rejected the opportunity. It would not be until the 1970s that you would see African Americans once again reelected. This was such a radical movement that I am forced to believe that it was at that moment that rancor and bitterness sank roots deep into the hearts of the South. One party was exulting in the conditions that struck off its shackles and made it free. The other party was despondent, humiliated, and angry because it had not only been beaten and defeated, but had lost long accustomed service and worse than being made dependent, it was forced to do for itself. There are a lot of people in this world that simply don't believe in win-win. I win, you win. There are a lot of people that say, oh no, I win, you lose. Now you're not going to change them, but I think the majority of people in this country will accept the fact or do accept the fact that I can win, you can win, and we can live together.